Myers. Good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning. Really, really happy to have you in here. I put you on the same level. Like, it's a dream of mine to have Joe Rogan on the show. I love oh, yeah, Joe he's Rogan. He's a great guy. He's a great guy. Great guy. Uh, but I view you on that same level. You've been uh, well, that's humbling. You've been a great mentor to a lot of people um, passively by writing mm-hmm. books and speaking engagements and really just being a. Try to set an example. Absolutely. Yeah, that's and the I, key. You've got an amazing one to set. The experiences mm-hmm. that you've had and everything that you've done is such a fascinating experience. So, uh, Great life. We're definitely going to dive into some real fun stuff today. But let's start with what brought you to the Puget Sound? Well, I was a school teacher down in Los Angeles. And my wife is from Bellingham. And we met on the first day of college when I went to Biola University. And uh, we got married, and we settled down in Southern California. And as the summer progressed, we had two or three months off, two months off. And we started coming up here in the summertime. And I looked around, and I said, my gosh, this might be the most beautiful place in the world. So I, I'm thinking, L.A. or Bellingham? L.A. or Bellingham? And I said, do I want to spend the rest of my life in I, you know, f- uh, traffic on 8 and 5 and everything else, Or do I want to spend the rest of my life looking at Mount Baker? And really, it came down to that. I said, where do I want to spend my life? What what do I want to be looking at? What do I want to be feeling and experiencing? And I said, I'm done. I'm done with Southern California. And my wife had become citified at that point. She was from a small town in Bellingham. We lived in San Diego at the time I made the decision. And she liked going to Nordstrom, even though Nordstrom's a local place here. There were nice shopping malls down there, a nice life. We had Mercedes. You know, everything was going great. Why go back to a small little podunk town called Bellingham? And I said, that's where life is. And so we bought a rental house, and we started renting it out before we moved. Got kind of settled, situated in the area. And then after about three or four years, we moved. That's fantastic. It's fantastic. Now, you obviously were very drawn to the area, and I know you're an adventurist, if you will. Right. What kind of stuff do you like to do here in the Puget Sound? Well, I'm an Eagle Scout, so I was always big into backpacking and hiking and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. So I came up here, you know, always hiking up Mount Baker and all the Cascades all the time and boating. I have a lot of friends that have boats, and I've been on Puget Sound, I can't even tell you how many times. And I'm a pilot. So my piloting activity is probably the most exciting things I've ever done. I have two planes. I have jet prop and a Diamond DA-40, and I've flown all over the Cascades. I've flown down ravines and mountain valleys, and I've done things that most people would say, you shouldn't have been doing that. <laughs> so I've, I've crisscrossed this whole state. I've landed over 500 airports all over the world, So and I've landed at so many airports in, in Washington State, I can't even tell you. So I've, I've just seen this country, this state, like nobody's seen this state. It's an amazing experience. When I was a teenager, I flew about 40 some hours in a Cessna 182 yeah. and a 152. Right. And I remember that feeling the first time I was in the back seat of a four seater 182. Oh, yeah. And I remember, I mean, I had, I had flown commercial plenty of times. Oh, and yeah. It's just such a different experience feeling that takeoff and, and kind of that pull that you got to try it in a jet prop oh. <laughs> when you have 550 horsepower yeah. in a single engine plane. That's a, that's an experience you'll never forget <laughs> straight up. It's amazing. Yeah. So how long after you moved to the Puget Sound, did you start fast cap? Uh, I started fast cap in 1997 and I believe we moved here. You know, I'm not good at dates. I'm 59 years old. And I don't even pay <laughs> attention to dates anymore, but I think it was in 86, 87 that we moved to Washington state right around there. So it was a little while. I started my cabinet making general contracting business over. And I was, to be honest with you, I really struggled. I mean, I, I was in San Diego, a lot of wealthy people. I built custom furniture. I did high end homes, you know, I had a great clientele base, and I came up here, and they, people didn't have money up here comparatively to Southern California. So I struggled to get my business going. And the funny thing is I almost went to work for the refineries. I don't tell this story. In my last, in one of my most recent books, Lean Life, I talk about it, that I was so frustrated with trying to compete with Home Depot and Lowe's and not, not besmirching them at all. They have their business model that I wanted to just get a regular job. Imagine Paul Eakers getting a regular <laughs> job. I, I applied at BP at the oil refinery. There were 800 jobs uh, 800 people applied for the job, and there was one job. Uh, they gave you three interviews, and I was one of the guys that got the interview. And I thought, for sure, I'm going to get this. I'm college educated. You know, I'm a business owner. I got my act together for the most part. And I didn't get the job. And three wow. months later, I invented the Fast Cap, and that was a miraculous experience. 
tell me about FastCap. What do you guys do over there? I, I just want to give context yeah, before we yeah. dive into well, some of the I'm really stuff. a very simple guy. You know, there's nothing really profound about me at all. I was a DNC student in, in high school. It really struggled. I was a straight A student in college only because I worked my butt off and my wife wrote my papers for me. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's another story altogether. But the bottom line is I was a cabinet maker and I was covering screw holes inside of a cabinet, white melamine. People are familiar with that, that look. And I had to cover these little screw holes. And there was a mechanical uh, plastic cover cap that had a little nib in it that pushed into the head of the screw. And I hated doing it. It just kept falling out all the time. I have to cock them on and they looked like crap and they were dome shaped and they didn't match the melamine. And so I just took a piece of edge banding, uh, the stuff you put on the edge of the cabinet, and punched it out with a Christmas tree stamp that my wife had from Creative Memories and put some contact adhesive just like you did the acoustical ceiling tiles here. And I stuck it over the hole, and it looked really good. It looked way better, even though it was a Christmas tree shape. <laughs> looked way better than the one that I was using. And so then I spent the next three months figuring out how to mass produce or manufacture these. And so I developed that product. It was very simple. Uh, my wife and I were hoping, you know, single income. My wife was staying home uh, with our children at that point. She was a school teacher. She had quit. So it was just one income. And I was hoping that I would just make enough money to maybe go on vacation because we couldn't go on vacation at that point. One income, two kids, you know, new new business. There wasn't a lot going on there. And we were frugal with our money. We didn't spend money that we didn't have. So, uh, you know, the, the product just took off. People recognized it was a better solution to what currently was on the market. And then it led to one product after another. And here's the best part of the story, though, honestly, James, is when I went to the trade show to show it, a lot of other cabinet makers like myself, small, one- and two-man shop, came up to me and said, man, Paul, that was a great idea. I've got an idea. And I looked at him <laughs> and I go, I know what that feels like to be in a small shop and really not be recognized. I said, what would happen if I took the average cabinet maker, the average general contractor who's coming up with all these creative solutions and I started paying them a 5% royalty for their ideas? And here's the kicker, with no patent protection. So I had no reason to do this. I didn't have to do it. They could have told me their idea. I could have run with it. They could have never, nothing would ever happen. But I did just the opposite. We started honoring and respecting them. And the rest is history. We're doing tens of millions of dollars of business in 40 countries, and we get a new distributor every day from somewhere around the world. That's absolutely incredible. Yeah. And what yeah. a story. It's an amazing story. A lot of hard work. No kidding. But it's an amazing story. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. So I definitely, I, I think the vast majority of this, uh, because this is your area of expertise, we're going to be talking a lot about lean. Sure. Um, you've written multiple books on the subject. I've seen five you. now. Yeah, five, five books. Five, five That's books incredible. Um, I want to give some context. A lot of people, if they've never heard the concept of lean, they immediately go to health. This is a health thing. We're going to live lean, which is one, which of, is the, one of the books, which is one of the right. books. Right. Um, so if you could give a, explain like I'm five definition of what lean is, where it came from. And I'd love to hear about your time in, in Japan with yeah, Toyota and, yeah. and all that stuff as well. Okay. Well, lean is really the simplest concept in the world. Every day, you fill your life with processes. How you get your car keys, how you clean the bathroom, how you make your lunch, how you answer your emails. Every one of those things I just described is a process. How you brush your teeth, how you put the toothpaste on the toothbrush, put the toothpaste back on the counter, it's all a process. So all Lean is doing is saying from the time you start that process to the time you finish it, to look in between the two walls and say, how could I do that better? Where's the inefficiency? Where is the waste? Where's the activity that adds no value? So for instance, you're making your omelet in the morning and the target is to eat, to give nutrition to yourself. And so you go in the refrigerator and you spend time pushing aside things, trying to find out where the eggs are, where the butter is, where the hot sauce is. You're, you're, all that is wasted activity. What you need is the hot sauce, the butter, and the eggs. Boom. And the more quickly you can access those without any struggle is the objective. And a lean thinker would look at that and say, well, if I use the hot sauce every day, let's always make sure it's on the top shelf in the right-hand corner. And maybe there's even a prescribed place where that would go. And the same thing for the butter, the same thing for the eggs, same thing for the lettuce, whatever it is. 
But that's not the way we operate. We tolerate this sloppiness, which is the title of my latest book, uh, Banish Sloppiness. We tolerate this sloppiness, which adds enormous amounts of overprocessing and waste to our life. And we just amble through life doing this over and over again. So all Lean is trying to do is look at the starting point and the ending point of everything you do and eliminate the waste. And we don't do it one time. We do it as a lifestyle for the rest of our life. We think about it deeply and about everything we do. And so I've done that in my life, and the results have been astounding. And I've applied it to the way I travel, to the way I I eat, to the way I conduct my health, to the way I run my business, to the way I interact with you, to the way we communicate. Everything is open to being critiqued, evaluated, and improved on a continuous basis. That's lean. That's powerful. Where did lean come from? Where where was the concept originated from? Well, you know, if you really go back to the origins, uh, we'll go back and say Henry Ford had a lot to do with it. There's no question about that. And the Japanese saw what Ford was doing when they came to uh, Michigan. And Taichi Ono and Sakichi Toyota saw what the astounding results that Ford was having. And they went back and they said, look at, uh, you know, our country's been bombed out. We haven't got much left of it. We've got to figure out some way to be able to compete in the world market. And we don't have any resources. So the Japanese, and specifically Toyota, took the principles that Ford had laid out and improved upon them, applied lean. And... Well, Ford was rich with resources. He could afford to have, you know, three or four months of, of inventory. The Japanese could not. They didn't have that kind of money. So they had to figure out how to just have, you know, a few hours worth of inventory because they couldn't afford to have three or four months. That cost money. So they developed a, a concept called just-in-time. And Toyota really developed the concept to this high level that we know about it today. And that's why I spend so much time in Japan learning from Lexus and Toyota and that's kind of a little bit of the background. But I could go on and on. I, could, I mean, I teach on this. I teach on this eight weeks a year in Japan, so I could, I could talk your ear off about it. But that's the general outline. One of the things that really struck me as interesting about the lean concept and how you apply it to your own business really comes down to your employees mm-hmm. and the mentality that they come to work with. Can you talk about your two-second yeah. improvement rule? Yeah. So – Here's the beautiful thing about lean and why it works so well. Because lean obeys the laws of nature. And what I mean by that is simply this. That I believe God made man very unique. We have this big, huge brain on top of our head (laughs) that is capable of solving complex problems. And this is what our design is. It's not the design for you and me who are successful. It's designed for everyone, no matter where your station is in life. You were created with the ability to improve and think and solve problems. So the reason why lean works is because this is the essence of lean, is that we're looking at things, finding the problems, finding the weaknesses, improving them. But we're not in a lean environment, in a lean culture, we demand that it's total participation. That it isn't the smart people. It isn't the MIT people. It isn't the ones with the business degrees and the MBAs. It isn't the people with the black belts and the green belts. Two Second Leans rejects all of that. It says everyone can learn this and everyone must do it. It's mandatory. It's not an option. If you come to work for Paul Akers, I'm not hiring you to make woodworking tools and equipment. I'm hiring you to improve the way we make woodworking tools and equipment. And that's the difference. So your employees come to work with a mindset. I mean, are, are they spending dedicated time to this during their work day of figuring not out how are, to improve? Not only are they spending dedicated time, we give them the time. And this is another critical component. Most entrepreneurs can't get their head around this because we have to pay the payroll. We have to pay the medical insurance. We have to pay the 401k. We have to pay for all to keep the lights on. We have to pay for the gas, the electricity, the forklift, the propane, everything. There's so much that we have to be responsible for. And then just tell your people, hey, don't produce the things that actually pay for those bills. I want you to stop and actually fix the stuff that isn't working. It's very counterintuitive and it doesn't make sense. So at FastCap... We have a very simple routine. The Japanese word is kata, K-A-T-A. A very simple kata that we do every day and that's not negotiable. It's, we, it's, not, it's not like 
if we're too busy, we don't do this. We get it there at 7 o'clock in the morning. We sweep, which means to clean. We polish our entire facility. It's six years old. It looks like it's brand new, and it's just like, <laughs> ah, this is the most beautiful place I've ever seen in my life. We sort. We get rid of all the crap in our work environment that has nothing to do with the work we're doing. There aren't pictures stuck on everyone's computer screen. There aren't little bobbleheads anywhere. There's none of that in our facility. It's just the things we need to do the work to add value for the customer. And then we standardize. We create standards. We fix things. We create process improvements. We do that for a half hour. Everyone's making small improvements, cleaning, finding the problems. Then we meet as a team for 45 minutes in a morning meeting. We study history, the Constitution. We have a word of the day. We have a quote of the day. We study Deming's principles. Edward Deming's a statistician. We study Tai Chi Ono's principles. We have a history. I mean, it's like it's a university every day. And then we work. So after an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes, and I've spent thousands of dollars for people not to work, then we work. And in the next six and a half hours, we get more done than most companies get done in 40 hours. <laughs> what do you think the implications on your culture in your own company that's made? I mean, I have to assume that people adopt that. I mean, yeah, they have yeah, to, yeah. right? But I mean, how, how do you think they feel about that? I'm sure you get feedback. I mean, well, that's the great part about it is, you know, we're changing people's lives. I mean, they feel good about themselves. They feel good about work. They take these principles home. They apply them in the way they relate to their wife, their spouse. They are better husbands. They're better wives. Um, they're better people. They're better contributors to society. Our people speak in schools. They speak at organizations. They're asked to do things that most people people who work at a company wouldn't be asked to do. So we're creating a whole different kind of person, and that's the target. That's really my goal in life is to change the world and make the world a better place. It isn't to make money. We all have to make money. I make great money. I'm not, a, I'm not afraid of that. I'm not ashamed of that or anything like that. But ultimately, what gives me satisfaction is knowing that there are thousands of people around the world that are impacted by this simple concept whether I go to Kazakhstan, Russia, Africa, uh, Guatemala, <laughs> Portugal, Spain. I mean, people around the world are doing two-second lean. It's translated into 14 languages now. It's, uh, it's really a phenomenon that's hard to even comprehend. No kidding. Yeah, absolutely. So that's, that's the target. Change people's lives. Man. How many, how many companies would you say that you know of are actively engaged in using this like oh are. tens of thousands wow they're every, it's everywhere that's a lot so more than all, i would have thought oh it's all over the world it's everywhere wow. you can't go you can't go anywhere that it's not i mean okay it's everywhere nice yeah it's all it's i mean i field 300 to 500 communications a day from people all over the world whether it be portugal or brazil or or chile or it just it's everywhere it's everybody's doing it yeah it's smart yeah it's, it's very simple <laughs> it makes you know? a lot of sense yeah so let's talk a little bit about people who have never heard this before maybe they're hearing mm -hmm. this for the first time and they're like wow this sounds like a really interesting thing and maybe they're going to mm -hmm. go Watch your YouTube videos. And or, the best know. thing is I don't want anything. I'm not trying to sell anything. Right. There's no cost to any of it. It's yeah. just I'm teaching a very simple principle. Everything's free on my website. You know, there's, there's, no, there's no gimmick here. There's no, it's just simple. I, I learned this from Toyota. I'm very grateful for it. They didn't charge me to learn it, and I'm just <laughs> paying it forward. Absolutely. So let's talk about the leadership in business, mm -hmm. that they're not actively engaged in lean thinking and their employees that are under them are not engaged in lean, lean thinking, mm -hmm. what would you say to that person to kind of spark them into that direction? You know, I don't know that I could say anything, to be completely honest with you, James. I, I've learned in life that you can't, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. And I, I'm done trying to convince anybody of anything. I don't, that's not what I do. What I do is I live a life that hopefully sets a good example, and the people that are hungry do something with it. I don't, I don't. I could care less if you don't get this. It doesn't bother me at all. That's your prerogative. You know, I'm concerned about the people that do want to learn. Those are the people that I'm interested in helping. Yeah, I know it's a very counterintuitive way. No. I, I'm not trying to push this on anybody. It's, yeah. it's, push is the biggest waste of time. And believe me, God, I spent a good part of my life pushing things <laughs> on everything from my wife to my kids and everything else, and I failed miserably. So push doesn't work. It's all based on pull. And this is a Toyota production system. If the customer wants a, a red car with the tan seats, how do you give that to them efficiently and effectively? That's based on pull. Let the customer pull. 
the same way in which I espouse my thinking here. I put it out there. If you want it, take it. If you don't, don't. I'm not, I'm not, convinced. I'm not trying to convince anybody of anything. At what point did you decide that the lean mentality needed to go from a business application to your life? Oh, that's a very good question. At what point? Well, I think that probably after about two or three years of doing lean in my company and seeing the incredible results that we got, you know, I tell a couple stories in the book. We took processes that took 45 minutes and I was an expert at because I'm a manufacturing guy. And I'd set up these processes and they took 45 minutes to do. And when Toyota came in, they reduced them to five minutes. Whoa in one week Whoa. that's what that's what an idiot i was that's how clueless i was wow. now in the context the bank it's very difficult to get a, a line of credit or money from a bank when you're a startup company the bank said they'd give me any amount of money i wanted i was applying for a quarter of a million dollar line of credit and they don't do that and they said i've never seen a company so well run and so well managed as this and then toyota came in a week later and said this is the most screwed up company i've ever seen <laughs> And then they proceeded to show me how screwed up it was. And this is a guy who won business of the year and was making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year when Toyota came in. So when the Japanese came in and saw what I was doing, they humbly just said, oh, well, I think there might be a better way. <laughs> and then I said, show me. And they showed me. And I said, ah, oh, guess what? I'm clueless. And I don't know what I'm doing. So... I proceeded to follow it. And so to answer your question, after three years of, of success after success after success, I started thinking to myself, gosh, this is really like could be applied to everything. The way I make my lunch, <laughs> the way I clean my bathroom, the way I clean my car, I got to apply this to everything. So I just started looking at everything through a different paradigm. Then before long, I'm traveling all over the world, both speaking because of my book and with customers, meeting customers. And I'm looking at the clunky process of travel and check in and check out and getting on a plane and getting off a plane and checking into a hotel and the way they clean the hotel room. And I'm looking at everything. Oh God, everything's a mess, right? So lean could be applied to everything. Processes could be improved everywhere. So that's when the epiphany really hit me. And I go, my gosh, this applies maybe to the way I'm my health, I was uh, 243 pounds, you know, I'm wow. 175. Wow. I mean, I mean, I said, well, how, how, am I how, how am I putting nutrients into my body? What's the process in which I'm taking care of myself? How can I apply lean principles and improve that process? I started thinking about everything. And, you know, I just had a guy the other day contact me and say, Paul, your next book should be Lean Finance. Mm. And he said, I think people really dig that because people really don't know how to handle their money. And how could you apply lean? What's your financial journey? And how have you applied lean principles to that concept? And I said, I wrote it down in my, in my wonder list. Uh, yeah, that's a good book title. It's a good, it's relevant. I think that would be really big. And I'm kind of curious, would you be willing to give some examples of lean financing technique just to kind of give some examples of how this could be applied well i think at the at the core of of lean is you can't spend what you don't have mm. <laughs> right and i think most people love to be lured into borrowing money and and things of this nature and that the biggest principle of lean finance is are you ready for this, this i'm ready is maybe gonna shock maybe some of the lis listeners, they probably never heard this before, money suffocates creativity. Mm. So we all think the problem is money. We all think we need more money. When the truth of the matter is we need less. If you have less, you have to think more deeply about everything you're doing. So if you want to become unsuccessful, just go get a bank loan. <laughs> Right? Just go borrow money from your parents or your relatives. But if you want to really become successful and be on a trajectory that's sustainable, try to figure out how to do it without much money. That's lean. I like that. I like that. Man. I'm sitting here thinking to myself, and I've thought about this. You know, We've spoken a little bit about this before, but you recently took a trip. Mm -hmm. You were with our United States Navy. Right. Right. And we don't need to go into details, but you saw a certain level of waste. Yeah, I did. And being a vet myself mm -hmm. and having been in the Army, I've seen that as well. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that extends out. Well, I think we could cap the umbrella at the government in general. Mm-hmm. How big is our U.S. deficit right now? Yeah, say over it twenty trillion. Twenty yeah, trillion yeah. dollars. Is that a? I mean, that's a pretty big number, right? <laughs> <laughs> A that's, number I don't understand. Exactly. I yeah, mean, how do you even wrap your head around something mm-hmm. that big? And yet we have, it's in the news all the time. And I think we see it firsthand. Mm-hmm. Our government wastes a lot. Yeah. Well, there are four efficiencies of spending money or inefficiencies. Yeah. You ever heard of before? The <laughs> yeah. first one is you make your money and you spend it on yourself. That's the most efficient way. You make a buck, spend a buck. You might extract a buck worth of value out of there. The next one is you give your dollar to somebody else and let them spend your money. Maybe you get 50 cents on the dollar. And then the next thing, or you actually you spend money on them, you buy them a gift, and you're lucky if you get the right gift, right? So maybe 50 cents. Then you give them your money and let them spend it. Maybe they're getting 25 cents on the dollar. And then the last one is you give the money to the government, and they're lucky if you get two or three cents on the dollar <laughs> of value. So, yeah, it's it's a problem, and uh, it's, it's a big, massive problem. I mean, to implement something like this, because what we're talking about is a core ideology. Mm -hmm. This is about how we look at situations and how we build plans and legislation and all those kind of different things. I know you you have a lot of political experience. Mm -hmm. Um, And ran for the U.S. Senate. You know, I'll tell you something funny, James, that I did after I went on that trip. I wasn't there to be critical, and it was an extraordinary event. I got to land on an aircraft carrier and be catapulted off. So there aren't very many people (laughs) in the world who get to do that kind of stuff. And it was was a pretty outrageous (laughs) experience. So... But I offered the captain of the ship and the XO of the ship that if they wanted, I would let them come to Japan with me. It's a $10,000 trip. I'd pay for all the expenses. I'd provide a book for everyone on the ship, 5,000 sailors. And I would give them all my consulting fees, which are very, 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 very expensive (laughs) at no charge. That I would do anything in my power to help the U.S. Navy uh, maybe learn some of these concepts. Wow. And what did they say to that? You know, it's interesting. You know, I, you know, they, they, they sent me back a reply, and they said, uh, well, look, we're looking into it. <laughs> so I don't know where it will go. I would definitely cross my fingers that they take advantage of that. Yeah, I, I would love that. I have I a lot love. of Navy brothers that are yeah. probably sitting here going, man, where were you 15 years ago? Yeah, it would be wonderful. <laughs> I'd love it, too. It would be a huge thing. And I, I don't want anything. I just want to see people's lives improved. Absolutely. So going back to the government, I mean, how – with such a deep rooted mentality that mm-hmm. our government has, how do you even begin to implement something this big that could have, I mean, the impact that this mentality could have on the government right. is endless. Right. So I'll tell you the way I tell everybody to do it. Okay. So let's say you have a company of a hundred people. Let's say the Navy's, uh, you know, a million, I mean, the, the, the military's a million people, whatever it is, okay? But let's just use 100 just to make the numbers easy and for people to understand. So you don't walk into a company and you say, I want to get all 100 of those people engaged now, right? It just doesn't happen. <laughs> Can I make that noise? Yep, okay, okay. Yep. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't happen. So what I tell people to do is in that organization of 100 people, There are probably two or three people that when you talk about this or they read my book, they go, this is it. (laughs) This is the holy grail. This is what I've been looking for. You need to find those people and you need to forget about the rest of the 97, all of them. Just put them out of your mind, over with. You need to spend all your time teaching, training, and nurturing those three and allowing them to develop a laboratory of excellence in their small sphere of influence. If they're recording podcasts, if they're answering emails, if they're packaging mail, I don't know what they're doing in your organization, whatever they're doing, make that a laboratory of excellence so that other people can poke their head inside there and go, what the hell is Mary (laughs) doing in there? Look at the way she's doing that. And what happens then is a few people come in and say, I could try that in my place. And then it begins to spread through the whole organization. But if they don't have a clear model of what it needs to look like, it will never go. And really, that is what I've done at FastCap. We're a small company. I have a little under 50 employees. And yet we have the biggest companies in the world from Amazon, the U.S. Navy, Bombardier, Boeing. You couldn't name a company, including Toyota, that hasn't been in our plant. We have people in there nonstop looking at what we're doing. Why? Because we've taken those 40 plus people and created an extraordinary example of what lean thinking looks like. 
And that little tiny company is influencing the world. And that's all you want to do in your company. Forget about the 97. Find the three, work with them, develop them, and they it will spread. I'm just sitting here thinking, and I think we talked about this before, but that could apply to anything. Yeah. This could be a nonprofit organization. Absolutely. A, I mean, any organization. It applies to everything. It applies to everything. It applies to everything. That's why, that's why when people really understand the simplicity of what I'm really talking about, that's why it goes crazy because it, everybody gets it. I always my, One of my favorite stories about when I wrote my book was I think, I don't know, maybe about three or four months after I wrote the book, it didn't take off like really fast right in the beginning. Maybe after about six months, people started buying it and you know stuff like that. And we got an order from Coca-Cola, if I recall, for 600 books. Whoa. And that was a lot of books. That's a lot of books. And so my wife called up the uh, the person that placed the order. It was like the, the secretary for the vice president or something. And said, why did you buy this many books? And she said, because the president understands what you're saying and the janitor understands what you're saying. Whoa. Whoa. And the rest is history. Whoa. That would not have been an answer that I expected. Yeah, everybody gets it. It's so simple. That, you know, There's nothing convoluted about any of this. One of my favorite books is, uh, uh, the uh, what is it, uh, Insanely Simple, the story about Steve Jobs. Yeah. And one of the beautiful ideas or concepts in that book is that complexity repels people. Simplicity attracts. So I've, I've spent my whole life making things very simple to attract as many people as possible to the concepts. And most people who are intelligent and accomplished, we like to complicate things because it adds value to our persona. We're the smart people. Oh, you need Paul Akers to come in and explain this all to you. <laughs> and I'm saying, you don't need Paul Akers at all. This is brain-dead simple stuff. Man. So you're a pilot. You're writing books. You're running a company. You're consulting. You're traveling around the world. You were just skiing, right? Yeah, just skiing. <laughs> skiing in Idaho. Yeah, yeah, actually in Grand Targhee, one of the most incredible ski resorts in the world. It takes forever to get there, but I always wanted to go there, so I went there. What kind of I, – I have to assume that because you've been doing this for a long time mm-hmm. – and you're making everything so efficient. Is that what allows you the flexibility? Absolutely. I mean, somebody would argue that that's you're juggling a lot. Uh, of things, I, I right? live ten lifetimes. I'm living ten lifetimes, and most people can't figure out how I'm doing. Well, you know, do you answer three to five hundred communications a day? The answer is no. I do every day seamlessly. It's not even an issue for me. And I ski, and I fly, and I travel around the world, and I speak all over the world, and I run my company, and you know, I, I just. It's all effortless to me and write books and my house is unbelievable and my yards are unbelievable and I do real estate deals all over the place. You know, I, I, I don't perform a process unless it's been refined and is in the process of being continually refined. You know, I could show you a great thing. My gardener, I taught my gardener this concept. He's a young kid. His name's Dimitri. He just sent me a video of how he improved the way he's pruning all the trees because I have a beautiful (laughs) Japanese garden at my house. And he climbs up the ladder and he has a pruning saw and he has a pair of clippers. And then when he go up there, he would not really have a good place to put them. He'd sometimes put them in his pocket. So he put magnets on the top of the ladder and magnetizes. So when he's up at the top of the ladder, he cuts a little bit, boom, snaps right into place. And boom, snaps into place and picks it off. And he's so happy because he made this great improvement. Well, when you're around and when you when you have a sphere of influence where everybody in my life, everybody that comes into contact with me is doing this, it's pretty exciting. Changes a lot of the conversation, doesn't it? It's fun. It is. I mean, we have a lot of fun. Yeah. So what's next for Paul Akers? What's what's fun and exciting on your radar right now? Well, the my my ultimate target in life is to uh, to teach this concept to a country, to a world leader, to work mm. directly with a world leader, whether it be in Kazakhstan, whether it be in, in Afghanistan, who knows where it's going to end up being, whether it be in Guatemala, I don't know. Those opportunities are uh, presenting themselves to me as we go along. And the hope is if we can take a country with the influence of a leader saying, hey, this is the way we're going to do this in this country, and we're going to become an extraordinary country, and we're going to set an example for the rest of the world, then if we, have a, if we can create a, a country that does this, 
then the rest of the world's going to pay attention and they're going to say, this is a better way to do business. This is better for everyone. Everyone wins. It costs less money, less resources. I always, uh, you know, I probably turn off 50% of your listeners right now. You know, I'm not a big green person because I, I kind of think of it as green washing. If you want to know what real green is, you talk about lean. When you teach everybody to be thoughtful about all the resources they're consuming, not by contributing a dollar to carbon credits or, or feeling good about yourself because you're, you, you didn't use a straw or something like that. What about if every activity in your life was being filtered through, how could I do less with more? Could you imagine what would happen? This is real green thinking. This is real planet saving thinking. And this is what my target is, to teach people to think differently and not just feel good about themselves, but to actually be doing something substantive that changes their lives, their family's life, their society's life, and ultimately the world just by looking at every resource that we are presented with and using it in a very wise way. There's my target. The implications of all of this, I do, you can... It's just impossible to wrap your head around. Yeah, it's so it's big. Fun. And at that scale, see, I, I like that mission mm -hmm. because that's what you need. You need proof of concept on a governmental level. Yeah, absolutely. And people will follow. I, I agree. The military has a term called leading from the front. Right. You're, you're the tip of the spear. Right. And in that mentality, it doesn't matter what anybody else is doing. They right. can They can be off doing whatever it is that, that they want to do. But if you're leading from the front, you are setting the example. Absolutely. People do fall in line behind that. Right. So a good example of how I do that in my life is, you know, I walk into the bathroom in an in a, uh, a airport or whether it be in a public restroom in Starbucks or whether it be in the plane that I just got off of. And I always look around. And I leave it better than I found. It. I take everything, wipe everything up, pick up the, the, the dirty stuff on the floor. You know, you walk into a bathroom on an airline and you know, oh. there's crap all over the floor. <laughs> I always pick it all up. I always leave it. I'm always thinking, wipe the toilet seat down, leave it clean, clean the mirror. I do this in Starbucks. I'll do it anywhere I go. And, you know, I'm, I don't need to be doing this. I could have servants following around all for the rest of my life and never spend the money I have. But that's not the way I think. That's a resource that has been given to me. I need to be grateful and respectful of that resource. And I wouldn't even have to clean up if everybody thought this way, because then I wouldn't even have to take the extra paper towels to clean up if people were just more respectful in the way they use things. And I'm not here to criticize people. We just need to change our thinking. And the amount of resources that we'd be consuming would be so dramatically decreased. It would almost be staggering. And this gets into a deeper conversation of some of the problems I believe we have in this country with society. Mm -hmm. Because I would argue that let's call you the 0.1% here, that 99.9% .9 of people walk into that bathroom and think... It's not my job. It's not my job. Yeah, it's not, not my, my job. monkey, not my circus. Right, right. I'm going to use this resource and move on to somebody mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. It's somebody else's job to, That's to do that. That's correct. Right? Wow. So is this kind of the... Because obviously there's a lot of societal problems, right? Mm -hmm. That this, I mean, lean doesn't fix everything necessarily, but man, I mean, the, the improvement... It fixes a lot of stuff. It fixes a lot of yeah, stuff. I mean, yeah. the improvement that we could have as a society, and I'm just thinking about... I mean, we're on such a downward trend right now. You yeah. know, there's... there's, And not to be a pessimist, but I mean, right. we, we have some issues, right? right. No, we don't. Well, we have, <laughs> there's some I mean, you just need to look issues. at the homeless problem out there, and you just you go, well, we got some serious problems here, right? And, you know, there isn't one magic bullet, but the biggest bullet that's going to change everything, the biggest mag magic wand is the more people we can get to just stop and think about what you're doing a little more carefully. Think about the resources, that, the gift that has been given you. Because, again, you have to approach this all, and this is really what what is the impetus behind some of my thinking and philosophy, is I'm grateful. I realize that I, I haven't figured out why I wasn't born in Bangladesh. Mm. You know, I haven't figured out why I'm not the child on the side of the road begging with their arm cut off or has been blinded. Because these are realities. I've been in 105 countries. I've seen some pretty wicked stuff. And for some reason, Paul Akers was born to Harry and Liz Akers, you know, and born in the United States. And that had nothing to do with me. I was born in the greatest country in the world with the greatest opportunity in the world. And... I'm grateful for that. And so 
I look at the resources that have been given me and the opportunities that have been given me, and I, I got to be careful with those resources. I'm, I can't squander those because everybody doesn't get those. I'll tell you a great story that, that impacted me a lot. I was in Thailand, and I was on a tour there. And our guide spoke really good English. And I asked him, have you ever been to the United States? And he said, oh, yes. Yes, I've been several times to the United States. And I said, what did you think of it? And he said, everything has been prepared for you. Hmm. And you really think about what he was saying. And I questioned him further. He said, you know, in Thailand, we want to do something. It's a struggle. It's a struggle to get good education. It's a struggle for the system to work and be fair. Everything has been prepared for you. That's the reality. It really makes me think, and I'm the picture that came to mind, the biggest waste that I think I've ever seen when it comes to food mm -hmm. is walking into a grocery store and seeing fruit in a plastic container like an orange that's been peeled, but it's still whole, that's just sitting in a it's plastic just, container? Yeah, it's crazy. What? Yeah, yeah. That blows my mind. Well, you want to know, you know, see, this is what I do. I lead trips in Japan, and I take executives and leaders from all over the world, and we take them into Lexus, and we take them into Toyota, and we take them into Tier 1, Tier 2 suppliers. And you would think all those experiences would just blow them away, and indeed it does. But there's an experience, actually, that blows them away even more and almost brings some of them to tears. And you know what that experience is? I take them to a Japanese school mm. and they see children sit down 500 children in a cafeteria happy smiling polite respectful and they eat every grain of rice on the plate now this is one of the wealthiest countries in the world highest savings rate per capita anywhere in the world greatest manufacturers in the world they have resources like nobody has resources comparatively, but it's because they respect the resources they have so much. So if you walk into an American school, there's a trash can filled with food that's been thrown out, that the children have no concept of the value. But in Japan, nothing is thrown out. That all those children eat all the food on their plate and the minute they get the food if they can't eat that rice they can't eat that broccoli and there's no sugar there's no sugar on the plates there's no crap on the plates it's vegetables rice and fish and if they can't eat all that rice they can't eat that broccoli before they ever touch it with their chopsticks they take it back up they explain respectfully to the person that served them I can't quite eat all that broccoli they take the broccoli off the plate so it can be used by somebody else. They go back and sit down and they eat exactly all the food that was given to them. And this mentality, this change in perspective is so massive. And they look at me and they go, these are children. Adults don't use their brains at this level. And yet everywhere in our country, and I love my country, this is not about being critical of America, we throw out so much. I'm as guilty of it as anyone. But in Japan, it's a different mindset. A deep respect for people and resources. Is Japan perfect? I know I have listeners right now that are thinking, oh, Japan's got this problem. This. Uh, Japan's got plenty of problems. We all have problems. We're just saying that the way they manage their resources is extraordinary, and we can all learn something from that. There's a big piece of this, too, that I almost have to wonder at what age, and maybe you know this, at what age do you think in Japan this mindset is taught? Do you mm. think it's taught specifically? Is it taught through example? Oh, yeah. It's taught from very early. I mean, they, they bring this understanding. The word in, in Japan is called motainai. Motainai have a deep sense of regret to waste something. And so the way it's explained is you're brushing your teeth, you turn the water on, and the water's running. It's not adding any value. You're brushing your teeth, but the water's going down. Motainai. Why? Why? Why would you waste that water? Why would you waste the time, the energy to pump it out of the ground? 
to put chlorine in it to purify it, to put it in the pipes and run it through the pipes and the electricity and the heating and everything it took to harness that so we could come out that faucet. Multinai, why, why would you waste that? So they teach this concept from a very early age. So why would you take food that the farmer has toiled over, the rice that they've, they've harvested, that they've, they've put on a truck, they've packaged, they've taken it to the market, then transferred it to distribution site, and then prepared it and heated it and cooked it, and then the resources to serve it, and then take it and only eat half of it and then throw it in the trash. Motainai. To have a deep sense of regret for waste. This is the thinking, and it's taught from a very early age. And this is what transformed my mind as I've spent so much time in Japan, understanding these powerful and beautiful concepts. There you go. It's mind-blowing. It is mind-blowing. It's, it's something that I think, I mean, I would love to experience that. And yeah. I think a lot of other people are listening to this, but too. But let's going, hope that captain of that ship takes me up on it. No kidding, right? Because that's exactly what he'll see. That would be an incredible. I mean, what a life-changing experience to be able to see that. And mm-hmm. I, we were talking earlier about just the sheer advantage you have in life mm-hmm. because you've been to so many countries, because you've experienced different I'm very culture. Lucky. That's I'm, I'm so lucky deal. I can't even believe it. And, and you know, my target's 200, and I've been to 105. And it just, uh, every time I go somewhere, whether it be in Bhutan or, you know, or uh, Myanmar or, you know, I've been all through, everywhere in China. I, I know China like the back of my head. I've been there over 50 times. And so I could talk in great depth about uh, what's going on in China and some of the issues there. But it doesn't matter. It, it, it does allow you to view things differently and see that we could do things better. And I think that's what people need to hear is there's a world outside of your world. Mm-hmm. There's something outside of your little utopic dome. And it's exciting. And it's really exciting. And like, they're cool people. Yeah. People yeah. are people. It doesn't matter. You know, you've been to Afghanistan and Iraq mm-hmm. in your service. And ultimately, people are people. You know, and we've heard that cliche before, but it very much, you know, they, they want to provide for themselves. They want to take care of their family. They want security. And if you can give them a way to improve all those without spending an enormous amount of money, just by just changing your thinking, it's pretty incredible. I'll tell you a great story uh, of that. So I, I go to India and they knew Shrevanamson is one of the top industrialists in India. He's a billionaire and he owns a company called TVS Motor. He's a friend of mine. And they make uh, a quarter of a million motorcycles a month. Whoa. So this guy knows what he's doing. And he decided that he wanted to lift a few million people out of poverty in India. So he went in and taught these villages went from one village to another and taught them the Toyota production system, taught them the elimination of waste through better management of animal husbandry, better management of their crops, better management of their water systems, better management of their schools, all by deploying continuous improvement, the Toyota production system. And the results are, to date, the last time I talked to Benu, I think they've lifted six million people out of poverty, where there's no running water, no toilets, the schools don't work, everything, to villages, and I've been to them. They took me. And villages that are prospering, the businesses, the schools are functioning, the, the, the crops are being harvested, all through the elimination of waste. So Venu told me a great concept when I was interviewing him in his office in Bangalore. I said, Venu, can you, can you, uh, can you give me some insight to where this is all coming from? And he says, Paul, I'll tell you what happened. 30 years ago when the Japanese came to India to teach me about the Toyota production system, I was all consumed with the idea of the next marketing program, how he's going to grow my company, how we were going to make more money, how we're going to do all this. And my sensei said, they knew, they knew, they knew. Your wealth is in your waist. Who? Wow. Just like Venu taught these poor, impoverished people, you think they need more money. They need more resources. Your wealth is in your waist. Wow. Makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. That's powerful because, I mean, how applicable is that to this it's, country? It applies to all of us. Oh, my gosh. We, we think we need more. We don't need more. We need to start using our brain. Man. 
Wow. And that's really what happened with me. You know, you take someone like me. I didn't go to MIT. I didn't, I didn't you know, I, I was, everything was a struggle for me in school. My dyslexia, I had problems. Did I need special education? Did I need, did I need them to spend more money on me? No. All I needed to do was just learn to think a little bit differently. And from my lack of abundance in one respect, my lack of my IQ, the, the ability, the fact that I wasn't the Rhodes Scholar, I wasn't the best football player, I wasn't the best looking, I didn't have all the Ital talents or accoutrements given to me. I came from a middle class family. I didn't have anything, but I found my wealth. And I'm not talking just about financial wealth. I'm talking about wealth of life by eliminating my waste. Man. <laughs> okay. So I think we've got a pretty good rat. You know, we're wrapping our heads around mm -hmm. what this is, right? I'm so glad you came here, man. <laughs> didn't, it work, didn't it work out pretty crazy? It really did. Yeah. Been, you should tell the listeners how this worked out. Cause. So I, I've been trying to get you on the show since, I mean, well before. I mean, the idea for this came in September of 19. Right. Um, and you were, we created a, a list of the top people who we thought would be, you know, high level. Like Misha Tate, for instance, she's mm -hmm. a UFC world champion from Tacoma. Like it makes perfect sense to have her on the show. Right. And there's been, I mean, there's so many people in the Puget Sound doing such incredible things. Talents and everywhere. I want to highlight that. I really want right. to boost that up. And so you were you were on, on top 10 of my list from mm -hmm. the very beginning. And so I sent you a couple of messages, tried to connect with you through multiple different platforms, just trying to get in front of you, knowing that you're dealing with 50 but million soon, things. Yeah, but as soon as you sent me something on WhatsApp, yeah. I replied yep. immediately. Yeah, that's, right? that's what it is. That's you, you finally, don't send me an email. Yeah, right. I, you, finally, you finally did respond from LinkedIn. Right. Um, oh, is that what? Yeah, okay, it, good, it was LinkedIn, good. and you're like, hey, I don't look at LinkedIn much to be honest. Okay. With you. Yeah. Well, and, and you said something that was very interesting to me, and I wasn't surprised by it one bit. You said, I don't communicate well here. Um, yeah, contact to, me through WhatsApp. WhatsApp. Right. And the way that you communicate, I, I have to call this out because it's the epitome of who you are. Mm -hmm. You don't text. Yeah, no. You don't text. I don't Every, have time for that. Everything you do is through voice. Yeah. You don't spend the time to sit there and, and type everything out. Every single message is exactly what it's supposed to be. Right. And it's just, hey, quick play, listen. And I picked that up right away. Mm -hmm. Right? I responded back with the same thing. And it's just such an amazing thing. But it was. It was you know, hey, we'd love to have you on the show. Like two days ago. It was this was two days ago. Yeah, two and days ago. and I'm like, hey, I'm you know, I know you live a little bit far away from Tacoma, but I'd love to have you in studio. Um, are there any opportunities where you're gonna come down to Seattle or SeaTac and maybe we can, you know, just have you go a little bit further, right? And you say, you know what? I I don't really I don't, I don't go, get down I don't there. Go, I don't go down okay, there and I'm not gonna go down there. I don't want the traffic, <laughs> I don't want to do it, right? Exactly. Because it's a pain in the butt. Right. But you said I'm skiing in Idaho. And by some crazy uh, way, my plane takes me through SeaTac on Saturday. On Saturday. Can you make that work? And I had to move some things around, but I looked at my calendar and I'm like, oh, I'm not going to lose this opportunity. It could be months yeah. before I, I get you again. And so it just, the stars aligned. And, yeah. and then even further, I was booked on a 12 o'clock flight with another connecting flight at 2 o'clock. Yep. And I called Alaskan Airlines and said, can I get on the 8.30 flight, which would give us enough time to come down to the studio, record, and get me back for my next flight to go to Bellingham. That's right. And everything worked out just like clockwork. And it was like, okay, here we go. It's perfect. I love it when stuff like that happens. Yeah. And it's – thank you. No, oh, my really pleasure. It. Thank you. Please tell the audience and everybody listening at your website where we can find your materials and where we can dive into more right. lean concepts. Well, just paulacres.net is my website. But if you type my name, Paul Acres, into Google or YouTube, a whole plethora, thousands of videos thousands. and stuff will There's come There's a lot out. of videos. And it's all free. You don't need to buy anything. All my books are available in all kinds of different languages. You can listen to them all on YouTube streaming. You can go to Audible. You can go to Amazon. You can do all that stuff if you want. And lots of companies buy more than 20 books. You can get them for five bucks a piece. If you buy 20 or more and people buy hundreds at a time. But you don't need to do any of that. And I don't really want you to do any of that. Do the lean way. Just listen to me read it. <laughs> or the digital way. Download it on the Kindle on my website for free. We're not even going to ask for your email. We're not going to hound you for a bunch of personal information. I don't want anything. 
it's a hundred percent value. It's just all there, and and see that's the lean thinking. You know, I could say, well, let's create all the crap. I don't want any of that crap. Just go go to YouTube, Paul Akers, mm-hmm. Two Second Lean, ban his sloppiness. Start listening right now. Yeah, it's that simple. It was actually one of the first ways that I discovered you was was on YouTube. And right. I, I can't remember exactly what video it was, but it was one of your one of your international speeches. Right. And it was just. The whole concept, and then I got into, I read Workplace Management right? Um, about the Toyota production system and learned about Kanban and just all, awesome. it's good stuff. all the different things that are out there. And it changed the entire way that I look at business mm-hmm. and is now, I think, really starting to infiltrate the way that I live my life. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a big meal prepper, so mm-hmm. I meal prep right. two weeks at a time. And really thinking about how do we maximize right, sure. all of that. It's This is such a simple concept to apply, and it makes such a right. big... And even if it doesn't work, here's the other thing that really keeps people from doing it. Even if it doesn't work and you fail, don't worry about that. You learned. Mm. It's not a failure. So I do lots of things. with. I love to cook, and I cook all kinds of... And a lot of times it fails, but a lot of times it works. I'll tell you about something that I did just the other day that was so incredible. I like cauliflower pizza. Oh, yeah. And the problem is when you mix the eggs and the cauliflower and the cheese together, when you put it on the pan, it can kind of run out the sides. And so I'm thinking to myself, I could buy a little metal ring, you know, a little pizza ring, and then put it in there, and then it would kind of hold the edges firm, and it would all be good. And I'm thinking, well, I could do that. I could go out and spend money and buy a ring, and, you know, I could do something like that. And I said, what has a ring to it? I went and got a red pepper, sliced them about a quarter-inch thick rings, <laughs> Pack the cauliflower and everything into it, put it on a baking pan, and then made all these beautiful red pepper little individual sliced pizzas. Cook that, put the cheese, the tomato sauce, the basil, the tomato on top. And now I have this red pepper pizza that is the most outrageous thing in the world. And the red pepper holds it all together and bakes it perfectly. It was just an experiment. (laughs) I'm just like, this is fun. This is lean. It's amazing. It's amazing how it's just... It's what, everywhere. What could fix this? Yeah. We're really going to think mm-hmm. about this first. Fix what bugs you. That's my big saying. Fix, fix what, what bugs you. Everyone goes, where do I start, Paul? Well, is everything in your life perfect? Is, is, is something bother you? Does it bother you when you have to roll up that cable on the ground after we've done this thing? Mm-hmm. How could you do it? I was at the ski resort the other day at, at uh, Grand Targi, and I watched they had these ropes that they put between every part, every aisle, right? And so the guy's out there winding them up by hand, and he's taking all this time, and I'm looking at it. He's got this metal pole right at the end. If they just put a little wind-up wheel, the guy would take the thing and wind it up in a second, and then when he wanted to pull it out, he would just pull it out to the length he wanted it, but instead, they're unwinding it and undoing it and untangling it. And they do that every day. Year after year. And, year and after just, year. Because why? Is it because that guy's stupid? No. no. It's because leadership has not taken the time to slow down and train their people to fix what bugs them and to find the problems and, and find creative solutions to them. Just like my gardener put the magnets on top of the ladder. See, I taught him to think that way. And now everywhere you go, there are improvements happening. And he enjoys his work more. We get more done for less. Well, there's equity into what's going on. Hey, I had an impact on making that better. And I don't know if – I can't remember if you post them or if I've seen your employees post them maybe through – Oh, tons of – they're all – well – what happens is we make so many improvements all the time. We have a chat on WhatsApp where all, the, what all they're being done. Yeah. And then our social media person, Lori, just posts those all the time just to inspire people and show them what we're doing. And that's what it is. It's mm-hmm. your employees doing their 30 minutes out of the day going. Right. And they're literally showing, okay, I have this problem. I want to improve this process right. by two seconds. I'm going to build or I built this thing right. and watch how it improves my process. Right. And watching – I mean there's there's got to be hundreds of those videos out there, thousands. Hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands. I mean, there's so yeah. many. Well, here's the thing too, James. It, it, when I told you that we allow, we provide a half hour for them to do this every morning, that's only the tip of the iceberg because anybody can stop anytime they want during the day and improve anything. We want them to do that. And people say, well, they're never going to get their work done. He goes, uh, we get more work done in the six and a half hours than you'd ever dream of. We get more done in 40 hours than you get done. Oh, yeah. I mean, in the six and a half than right. you would get done in 40. Right. So I want them to slow down all they want. Yeah. We slow down to go fast. It's funny that this all starts with mindset. Yeah. This is about preconceived notions about how we should be mm-hmm. completing something. Right. Man, 
yeah. just a little perspective shift. Just tiny. And it's, it, we're really talking about a very small yeah. Yeah. change in the way you think. Well, there's no question that I think the people who have discovered you and your I, I always like to call what you do as evangelism. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Pretty I th- much so. I, I think it's a lot of passion, a lot is, of emotion wrapped up in it, yeah. a lot of a lot of good thinking. But that without any question, there is an emotional element. We're 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 appealing to the entire man, if you will, the entire person. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Paul, for everything that you do. Again, I can't appreciate you coming on the show enough and sharing your stories and your experience and your ideology. I think this Mm -hmm. is super powerful. I think everybody needs to hear it. I think I need to hear it, yeah. and I'm, you know, working on implementing that in my business. And we all need life. to hear it. I need to yeah. hear it. Yeah, I mean, it's for all of us. None of us are perfect, and it's about it. It's a journey. It's a lifelong journey, and it's not my ideology. It's something I've learned from other great people like Henry Ford, Tai Chi Odo, and I just it, it worked for me, and I just sharing sharing the love, if you will. Before we leave, what's your favorite book that you've written? That I've written. Yeah. What's what's your well, out, of, out of your library? What do you think is well? Is, the most popular is un, unequivocally Two Second Lean mm, in yeah. fourteen languages. That's a huge book. But the new book that I just wrote is very very important. Banished sloppiness. How I fell in love with precision while working in Japan. But you know that that is the book that is going to be the next Two Second Lean because it's already been translated into three almost four languages. It just got launched a month ago and already been launched in four languages, which is very unusual for a book that quickly. So that's going to be a huge book. But in terms of a substantive book that really, if we could reach the young people in this world, my book, Lean Life, it's a really a look at how I applied lean to my entire life in person. And it's a book that I wrote specifically. If I was 18 years old, I'm 59 today. If I was 18 years old and I knew what I know now, Hmm. Uh, there would be nothing I couldn't do in the world. There would, the impact would be so mind-boggling. So I wrote that book specifically for young people to say, think deeply about what you're doing here. And if you do, you're going to have a spectacular life. And that's what Lean Life is about. So, And we've got a lot of good reviews on that too. But it's a book that requires you to, to, to wrestle with yourself a little more. So it probably wouldn't be as popular <laughs> as the other books because the other books are just flat out fun and interesting and applicable. Or Lean Life, you have to wrestle with your, who you are and why you're pissed off about things. <laughs> <laughs> well, Paul, safe travels back up to Bellingham. Look forward to seeing all the yeah. – rest of the content you produce and all of your adventures around the world. And I am rooting for you to get some government involved. In oh Lane. yeah. I would love I'd, it. I'm excited to Good. see that process regardless of, I mean, I would hope it would be the U S but I, I don't have high hopes that yeah. they're ready for that. Step, <laughs> step by step. That's right. We're just, That's right. I'm just going to keep doing it. And I'm not going to worry about who, when and where I'm just going to do my job. That's my right. job is to eliminate the waste out of my life and fix all the stuff that screwed up with me and hopefully set an extraordinary <laughs> example that somebody might want to follow it. It's amazing. Paul, have a great day. Talk to you soon. Thanks, James. All right.